Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Family Voices with Patty Barron. It's my pleasure today, it really is my pleasure, to um, welcome our guest, Dr. Stephen Koza. And Dr. Koza is a professor of psychiatry at the Uniform Services University, where he serves as Associate Director, Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York, beat Navy, and received his medical degree from the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Koza is also an Army veteran, having served in the United States Army for 30 years. Dr. Koza, it's such a pleasure to have you at AUSA today. Patty, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I really appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So before we get started, I just really think it's always nice for our audience to get to know who our guests are just a little bit better. And um, you always, you know, you have a great family story and and uh, and we've been friends for a long time. So I'm going to take advantage of that friendship and ask you a couple of questions about um, about you. So where did you grow up? So I grew up in a suburb of New York City in New Jersey, a small town called Fanwood. I am the third of four in the family. I have two brothers and a sister. One brother was a, an army aviator who was in uh, the military for some time, mm -hmm. uh, no longer in. And we lived in that town for my entire childhood. So unlike a lot of military kids who move around and have a lot of transition in, in their lives, I had the opportunity to be in that one location and neighborhood for all of my childhood before going off to school. Oh, nice. I didn't know that. That New Jersey. <laughs> Would have put you in Brooklyn for some reason. No. And um, what about serving in the Army appeal to you? Well, Patty, my, my dad was a World War II Navy veteran. He served in the South Pacific during the later part of the war. And both of my grandfathers emigrated to the United States from Italy when they were teenagers and served in World War I. So my siblings and I grew up with a sense of pride in our country a desire to give back and a focus towards national service. So after graduating from West Point, I served in the Army Medical Corps. Throughout all of those experiences, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the most value-driven professionals and friends that I could have ever known. It's led to some wonderful friendships in my life, including our friendship. Mm -hmm. And now I have the opportunity to work at Uniform Services University, where in addition to my focus on clinical care, I have a chance to study and identify and write about and think about the needs of military families and kids and how we can best support them. Yeah, see, that's one of the things that I've always admired so much about you is the work that you've done with military children. And as a professional that's dealt with your entire career with, with working with military kids. What has stood out to you about military children? Well, I've always admired the diversity of the families that I work with, and it's a diversity within the context of a shared commitment to their units, to their service, to their communities. And because of those values, I see that dedication reflected in their children as well. So I'm always impressed by the strength of military kids, the grit that they bring to their lives and the strengths that they possess despite some of the challenges that they face. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are, as we know, many challenges that military children face. Some of them seem to thrive. I myself have three. Two of them really enjoyed the military lifestyle, but one of them really did not. And so uh, one of the things that people asked me when they knew that I was interviewing you was to ask you, uh, what advice would you give to parents whose children don't necessarily like that military lifestyle, that kind of it's challenged by it and who struggle with it and maybe don't feel like they quite fit in? Sure. Well, I think first of all, we need to remember that parents choose to serve and children follow. So children don't make the choice, but they either enjoy or are challenged by or embrace or engage or maybe have difficulty with the lives that their parents choose being in the military service. I think it's also important to remember, just as you're saying, Patty, that all children are different, even within the same family. So you can have children who are able to manage with the transitions that are associated with military life and move moves. And for other kids, that can be much more difficult. So we have to respect those differences. We need to always be looking for strengths in individual children, even if they are struggling. And we talk about resilience. It's not a character strength, but and it's not something that you're born with necessarily. But there really are skills that we can develop. So we should help our kids for those that may be having greater difficulty or for all of our children to learn how to better communicate, how to problem solve, how to connect with their peers, 
and others in the community. And lastly, um, especially as a clinician, what I would say is that we really need to recognize that there are resources out there for kids, and if they need help, let's get them help, uh, whether that's through their primary care providers, through pediatricians, or through the mental health services that are available in the community. Absolutely, and I think you said a couple of things that really resonated with me, uh, communication. I, being able to watch your children and realize when they might be struggling is super important and not being afraid to reach out for resources because it does a label is something that parents worry about my child is whatever but i think what i'm hearing you say is no you're really supporting that child's resiliency and helping to build resiliency if you need to reach out and and you know, kind of bring in some of those resources that are out there. Absolutely. We need to remember that strong people, strong children are not people and children that don't have problems. They are people that are in a position to go out and seek assistance and help and work on those problems. So we really want to encourage children. It's not about like covering up when we have difficulty, but really how do we solve a problem when we have it? How do we seek out help? Who do we talk to? How can I as a parent help my child? How can teachers, mentors, coaches, ministers, rabbis, priests help our kids when they're having difficulty? Because there are a lot of folks out there who are in a position to provide assistance. That's a, that's great, Steve. Thank you so much. And that kind of leads us right into uh, some specialty work that you have done. And that is with children of our wounded. If I remember correctly, a few years ago, you did a study on how a service member's wounds, ills, or injuries affect the children in that household. And what were your biggest takeaways from that particular study? Well, I think one of the things that's important within the complexity of a parental injury or illness, much attention is focused on that patient and children are often um, present and parents um, and other adults, healthcare providers don't necessarily recognize the effects on those children. So it's important to remember in any situation where there's an injury or an illness, it can be tough for the whole family, children included. Having worked at Walter Reed for years and seeing families that were dislocated with young children coming into the hospital setting, um, you know, children being away from home or moving in with distant relatives or spending time in the hospital, which can be a pretty scary place. Mm -hmm. How do we best support them in those kinds of situations? And then over time, children, if service members leave the military, they move to communities that are distant, perhaps, from military installations where they were. And so kids have to change schools, mm -hmm. change friends, change teams that they they were on, all of which can be really challenging for children. So I think the other thing that we learned was the importance of communication with children. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we as adults make two errors with children. Either we tell them too much or we tell them too little. Mm -hmm. And how do we come up with words that are helpful to children to understand what's going on with their parents at a level that makes sense for them? Whether that has to do with physical changes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, change in physical appearance or burns or an amputation, or whether it has to do with change changes in behaviors that might be related to post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder or a traumatic brain injury. But giving children an understanding through words at a level that makes sense for them, and that was part of the work that we had done in our studies related to communication, injury mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. How do we help people to better speak with their children about the challenges that they face? The other area that we need to be thinking about with military children and injuries has to do with caregiving responsibility. So it's not unexpected that parents who are out of commission because of an injury or illness, it might mean that extra pair of hands are required around the house, kids chipping in. But we also need to understand and make sure that we remember that the goal and the jobs of children is, are to grow and develop. And so mm -hmm. what we want to do is, if they're actively taking part in those caregiving activities, we just want to make sure there's enough room for them, for their lives, for their friends, for their other activities in life, and that any caregiving responsibilities they have aren't too close close, too intimate, too personal, mm -hmm. that wouldn't make sense for a child of their age to be involved in. The, um, that's such a great point and one that really resonates with me. I had attended an event with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, and we were talking about children as caregivers, um, secondary caregivers. And one of the things that we had a panel of parents, and they were talking about the fact that 
they really wanted to provide those activities for their children, but because of the schedule around the doctor's appointments or whatever was going on at home with that particular service member, it wasn't always possible. And I really felt for them because you're right, a child's job is to grow, develop, and a lot of that is done through play when they're younger and with peer interaction when they're a little bit older. And it just doesn't seem like they had that opportunity. You know, that is a challenge, I think, for families. I think one of the things that's really important for families who are faced with these kinds of situations, physical injury or invisible injuries that are chronic in nature, that we really want to make sure that there's a way of seeking out additional support for the families, whether that's respite care, whether that is activating an extended family, or certainly letting your community know mm -hmm. um, or neighbors know. And it may not have to do with the actual care of the individual, but what it may mean is, gee, if you're going to this practice or if you're going mm -hmm. to this event, would it be okay if my kids tagged along and mm -hmm. participated? Because it's a way of, you know, it does take a village. It does take a community and a neighborhood to raise children, and certainly in situations where a family is faced with additional challenges like an injury or an illness that's even more important. Absolutely. And and one quick um, last thing before we go on to the next subject, and that is you, you mentioned um, communication and talking to children at a level that they're able to um, understand. But what if you don't know what particular level that is, what developmental that is? Where would you send parents? Yeah, that's a, a great point. I would encourage uh, listeners to look at our website, which is www.cstsonline.org. That's all one word, CSTS online.org and you'll find fact sheets and materials there many of which are related to how to talk with children how to think about children's responses uh, whether it is related to these kinds of stressors or other military stressors mm -hmm. that occur in life P perfect perfect you're always kind of on the cutting edge of things steve especially when it pertains to military children and families and you're now involved in a new study having to do with family member grief associated with in-line-of-duty deaths. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, and, and thanks for bringing that up, Patty. This is an important study that we're currently recruiting for. It's called Stepping Forward in Grief. And listeners can read more about that at www.steppingforwardstudy.org. So the, the way the study came about actually resulted from work that we had done in another study called the National Military Family Bereavement Study, where we recruited family members who had lost loved ones on active duty or duty related on or after 9-11. And uh, we found that although most of the family members were doing well, there was a small but significant minority that continued to endorse very high levels of grief with grief associated impairment, sometimes many years after the death. Mm -hmm. And so it made us concerned about this group of individuals that may still be struggling. And some of them described having difficulty reaching resources because bereaved family members live all over the country and may not be close to resources that could be available. In some ways, this didn't surprise us because military deaths are unique, that in the decade after 9-11, about 85% of the deaths were due to sudden and violent deaths, whether they were combat, suicide, mm -hmm. accidental deaths, that, uh, and they were typically related to the untimely deaths of young people. So given those challenges, we know from the civilian literature that people who are faced by those kinds of experiences tend to have greater difficulty so our goal was to identify resources that might be of assistance to these individuals. And we teamed up with Dr. Catherine Shear at Columbia University to test the effectiveness of two virtual apps, online programs uh, that were designed to support bereaved individuals and their grief. One is called Grief Steps, which is based upon Dr. Shear's evidence-based work. She's done a lot of work in this area and has uh, developed evidence-based treatments that have been studied in randomized controlled trials, NIMH funded trials, and another program called Wellness Steps, which is based upon work that we know about how a focus on wellness can be very helpful for all people. And given some of the challenges that people who have been bereaved, mm -hmm. uh, we believe that both of these would be of help. These are not intended to be clinical programs or therapy. They're really providing grief support information and activities that we believe would be helpful. Individuals 
individuals who are interested will come to the study, uh, have a baseline evaluation, and if we find that they meet our inclusion criteria, they would be randomized to one of those two programs. Mm -hmm. And in addition to having the, the virtual programs, they would be assigned a guide who is a real person. It's not a therapist or a grief counselor, but it is somebody who's available to help them use the assigned program in the way that works best for them. I think that could really be a game changer, Steve. I mean, it's so, uh, just from personal experience, I, I think I've told you that my father died when I was five um, years old and um, living in El Salvador at the time, uh, within a few months, we, we immigrated to the United States. And my mom just didn't have the tools to know how to move forward in grief, if you will. And I remember every time it was my father's anniversary of his death, we were required to sit on the couch very quietly. We were not allowed to play. We were not to have fun because we were supposed to honor the fact that my father had died on that day. Right. And that has stuck with me for quite a long time. I would imagine that for families that are stuck, having this opportunity to use a tool that effectively is in your hand and can help you maybe get past that would be so incredibly important. And I'm just really excited uh, that you all are doing this. How, um, how can we help? How can families get uh, involved in this Sure. Well, first of all, thank you. That's what we're hoping. It is a research study. We believe that people will benefit from the participation in the study. But given the fact that it's a research study, our goal is to uh, demonstrate that one or the other of these programs is better mm -hmm. and that we then have an evidence base to work within the community to make it available more on a service delivery basis. So mm -hmm. that's our ultimate goal. So we are recruiting for the study currently, and we want to ensure that anyone who is eligible knows about the study and can choose to participate if they'd like. Again, as a reminder, the study's website is www.steppingforwardstudy.com. Dot org. That's all one word. It also is really important to know that we recently expanded our inclusion criteria. So now, rather than family members, close family members, only after 9-11, having a, a death after 9-11, we are now including any relation to the service member, distant relatives, close relatives of someone who died either in the military or duty connected, military connected deaths at any time mm -hmm. on before or after 9-11. And the other thing is that we're also including friends. So now if you've had a close friend who's mm -hmm. died in the military and you know we're including everybody, but we're specifically hoping to find people who may be having more difficulty that because mm -hmm. uh, that's really the focus of the study. Uh, but this would also include include uh, service members and veterans with unit members who died or battle buddies who had died because we recognize that grief is a part of military service as well. And uh, there are people in the community in a variety of places who could benefit potentially from their participation. Absolutely. The expansion of the study, I think, is, is incredible and very generous. Um, people do get stuck and, and you could have a different type of relationship than someone that's in the immediate family for sure. So um, I, it, unfortunately, it looks like we are um, a little bit out of time now, uh, Dr. Koza, and you've been just an amazing guest as I knew you would be. Any last thoughts, anything that you wanted to mention that we didn't get a chance to talk about? So and lastly, Patty, just to thank you again and AUSA and the listening audience for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, and I wanna remind folks that research gives us an opportunity to develop understanding as to what programs have the necessary evidence to be recommended to our military community. So we hope when we complete this study, our goal is to be able to bring those findings directly back to help military survivors around the country. Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more with the research part, helping and supporting not only families, but programs that support them. Uh, we recently had the top three uh, uh, folks from the Army here, the Secretary of the Army, the Vice at the time, uh, the Vice Chief of Staff and the Sergeant Major of the Army. All three of them said, you have to tell us what's wrong. You have to tell us what's going on because only then can we, we know know how to support you. And I would say the same thing. Get involved in research studies. Uh, it really just it 
helps everyone else if you do that. So thank you for all the work that you do, Steve. It's really incredible. And I've always just been so respectful of the work that you put into the lives of our military families and our military children. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Patty. And thank you for all your service. Thank you. So we've come to the end of our podcast episode. To all our listeners, thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. Keep it here on for all Army Matters and for next week's episode featuring Army thought leaders. I am Patty Barron with Family Voices, Family Strong, Army Strong.